Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a very important presentation on international humanitarian law. This event is sponsored by the American Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program. If you would like to learn more about the American Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program or learn how to get involved, please contact your local American Red Cross office for more information. Before introducing our speaker, I want to let everyone know this webinar is being recorded. A recording of this webinar will be available at www.rulesofwar.org slash webinars. Following the presentation, it will be uploaded there. This link will also be provided in the chat for those of you uh, who um, don't have a pen available to write that down. Our speaker today is Professor Jody Prescott. Professor Prescott lectures at the University of Vermont, where he teaches courses on energy law and climate change and cybersecurity law and policy. He is a retired judge advocate who taught at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and served as an observer slash trainer at NATO's Joint Warfare Center in Stavanger, Norway. He had operational tours in Bosnia as a NATO claims attorney and Afghanistan as the chief legal advisor for the multinational force. Jody is the author of the new book, Empirical Assessment in IHL Education Training. Today, Professor Prescott will be speaking on this new book. This book charts the use of data over the last 20 years to make IHL training more effective and links it with recent research that emphasizes the role of military leaders in building a values-oriented culture of IHL compliance with their soldiers. Professor Prescott, thank you for joining us, and now the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Christian. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules to join us today to talk about taking a different approach in IHL instruction to make it more effective in building moral decision-making resiliency in troops so that they're more likely to refrain from violations of IHL and challenging circumstances. I also want to thank the team at the American Red Cross for this wonderful opportunity to talk to the community interested in fostering compliance with IHL. My presentation represents the views of no US government organization and the views expressed are mine alone. Based on my experiences, my research and my writing, and probably similar to many of you, in the last 20 years, I've become aware of two important but diverging trend lines in IHL. The first line was the amount and the quality of the work that was being done by the ICRC and other IHL-oriented organizations, national governments, non-governmental organizations, CSOs, talented professionals in disseminating information on IHL, working to integrate it into military operations and activities, all with the goal of increasing protection for civilians and detainees in armed conflict. This is a very good trend line. Unfortunately, when I looked at different events in the world and the surveys done on global impressions and attitudes toward IHL by the ICRC over time, I also became aware of a second trend line. Simply put, in the last 20 years or so, there's been a profound decrease in the assessment of citizens of many different countries as to the value of IHL in protecting those who are not in the fight. Because of budget cuts at the University of Vermont due to the pandemic last year, I wasn't able to teach a couple of the courses that are usually taught. So last summer, I, I had some time on my hands and nowhere to go. And I started writing a blog post about measuring the effectiveness of IHL education and training to begin to remedy this divergence between these trend lines. Well, uh, it got out of hand. Uh, and so in a couple of weeks, the short book that I ended up writing will come out instead. I want to tell you up front where I ended up in the book. It was not exactly where I expected when I started. I realized that empirical assessment of educational and training effectiveness was an important part of addressing this problem, but it was no silver bullet all by itself. Instead, to succeed, it needed to be embedded in a very different and systematic approach to IHL instruction. So if you were to make me the world's IHL education and training boss for the day, and I had the resources and the buy-in from the training audiences to create my ideal education and training package, here are what the main features of it would be. Now, I humbly recognize that there are hundreds of dedicated IHL professionals working in this area every day across the world, trying new techniques, refining their lessons, 
um, finding new ways to make their lesson plans more effective, all with the goal of reducing the suffering of victims of armed conflict. I want to hear about their work and the innovations that they're coming up with. But so far, I am not aware that anyone has consistently combined all of these features that I've got listed here on this slide in a sustainable, systematic way. And let me explain briefly what I mean by these bullets, so you'll see where I'm coming from as we go through the case studies. Lean. By this, I don't mean a replacement for in-depth academic study or for gritty role-playing exercises out in the, the training areas. What I mean is a well-honed fundamental lesson plan that nonetheless ties into the rest of IHL instruction uh, throughout the course, say, for example, of a soldier or an officer's career. Multidisciplinary. I mean, multi -health, mental health specialist, behavioral health specialist, statisticians, survey developers, ethicists, perhaps even war correspondents, and you know, some lawyers. Positive professional military identity. By this, I'm talking about collective values for which the chain of command walks the walk as well as talking the talk. Testing. I mean assessment under some form of stress designed to familiarize troops with achieving resiliency in their decision-making under challenging circumstances. Military culture. I mean the use of positive attributes of different military cultures to streamline soldiers' uptake of basic IHL concepts and principles. Now, let us be blunt. Not all aspects of military cultures are good. But let's be like the Shakers, the 19th century, century religious group in New York and in New England, um, who practiced gender equality and made their living by selling goods to the rest of American society noting that they were in the world, but not of it. We can find things good about military cultures that we can leverage to increase compliance with IHL without having to buy in to all of it. Leveraging data. It is not an oxymoron to say that we should use automation and data to help us understand better the human reality of building ethical decision-making in a soldier or an officer over the course of their career in an affordable and sustainable way. So I'd like to explain now what the start point for my proposed blog post was going to be. <clears throat> in the summer of 2001, 20 years ago, I was the chief of the military law office at the US Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. My office decided to do a survey of the class of 2002 to start a project on IHL and rules of engagement training. We decided to sample the army officers who were in combat and combat support branches. And because of the Marine Corps unique nature, all of the Marine officers. These officers were almost all newly promoted majors who until fairly recently had been company commanders. We asked 408 officers in total, and of those, 188 responded. Interestingly, this response rate of a bit under 50% held true for each Army branch but one, and it held true for the Marines as well. The one? Of the 30 Army Special Forces officers asked to participate, none responded. After we evaluated the responses, we realized that although our survey had some flaws in terms of statistical rigor and question content, we did gather some data that challenged our assumptions. Amongst ourselves, we assumed at the start that the use of role players and situational training line, lane exercises, STX exercises, would likely be assessed favorably by these officers, and that the notion of reciprocity as the basis for compliance with IHL would not be. None of these assumptions were borne out. What surprised us though, because it was quite different from what we had experienced, is that these officers assessed the use of discussion and seminar format IHL training as the second most effective means to train junior enlisted soldiers, that is right behind the use of stick slings. Importantly, we were not able to administer the survey until after 9-11, 2001. So that means that the questions that we formulated 
were done before 9-11, and then they had to go through the approval process before we could administer the survey. The responses were given a few weeks later. Looking back now, we see that the questions that were asked of the officers, asking them to look ahead and talk about what they saw on the horizon for challenges in IHL training, we saw that these questions were not informed by the likelihood of full-scale insurgencies occurring that their troops would be involved in, and nor were their answers generally cast in that context. Relatively few saw a distinction between combatants and non-combatants as a troubling training issue. There are likely a number of explanations for this, but the bottom line for me is that the use of surveys to gather data for forecasting training needs in the future, even the near future, must be considered very critically and with open minds uncluttered by doctrine and media announcements. Well, starting later in 2001, the units to which the young majors at CGSC had recently commanded began deploying to Afghanistan, and then in 2003 with the invasion of Iraq. Beginning in 2003, and apparently through 2012, U.S. commanders in these theaters began commissioning mental health advisory teams, or so-called MHATs, to assess the mental well-being of soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. Most importantly for us today, the MHAT-4 survey of troops in Iraq in 2006, and the MHAT-5 survey of troops in both Iraq and Afghanistan in 2007, contained questions that address troops' attitudes and behaviors regarding compliance with IHL. The results of these surveys are a unique resource. Crucially, asking these questions in a medical context and framing them as concerning ethical violations and behaviors likely led, I believe, to troops providing more truthful answers than if they had been asked in a purely legal context. Further, the crafters of the survey carefully stayed within limits of what troops would likely to be willing to talk about, even in the context of a medical setting. I've given you an example of one of the MHAT-5 questions, so you can see how well-crafted it was to focus on those situations which were not driven by military necessity and which did not necessarily implicate a serious violation of IHL. Interestingly, although the two theaters were quite different, the survey results in many cases showed important consistencies like this one. The surveys also began developing an assessment of the factors that were associated with troops not refraining from unethical behaviors, including the length of time which the troops were deployed and the mental health issues that occurred amongst them in general. The crafters of the surveys carefully put the more intense questions in the form of hypotheticals, asking the troops whether they would report their comrades if their comrades committed certain violations. Obviously, the duty to report is a crucial piece of ensuring compliance with IHL. I provided two of the questions here. I was surprised when I read the survey results. Across the spectrum of lesser offenses, only about a third of the troops would report their comrades for violations, such as the unnecessary destruction of property. Less than I would have expected, but yeah, okay, it is just property. It can probably be repaired or replaced. What really made me pay attention was how few troops would report their comrades for injuring or killing innocent civilians, less than half. The surveys also identified risk factors for mental health issues among the troops, as well as protective factors. Risk factors included a more definitive association between intense combat and mental health issues, and a clearer association between higher levels of anger and rage among the troops with the reported unethical behaviors. I doubt this will surprise you, but finally we have it quantified in troops fighting in real time. Perhaps the most important protective factor was leadership. For those troops who experienced intense combat in the context of low non-commissioned officer leadership, 35% had mental health issues. The rate was half that if they assessed their sergeants 
as being quality leaders. This relationship held true with officers as well. Putting all of this in a larger context, I thought I saw something in the numbers that suggested a way forward. You'll remember from the previous slide that about 4% of the troops admitted to striking or kicking non-combatants when it wasn't required by the mission, one of the least serious offenses they were asked about. However, 57% of these same troops would not report a comrade for killing an innocent civilian. That is, they were holding themselves to a much higher standard than they would hold their buddies to. This suggested to me a, a reservoir of individual restraint that could be tapped into to narrow this disconnect. But how could this be done? Importantly, how could this be counted? An answer to this question was waiting for me in the pages of the Lancet and Fort Leavenworth's military review. In 2007, the commander of Multinational Division Center in Iraq was troubled by the results of these surveys, and he directed his staff to come up with a battlefield ethics training program for all his troops to begin to address these negative trends. His staff created a multidisciplinary team, one that received legal assistance in dealing with IHL questions, but not a team led by lawyers. The team developed a lean lesson plan with a basic script and clips from popular war movies to address different scenarios in dealing with civilians and detainees. The lesson plan emphasized the need to follow IHL and the impact of protective factors in units, all that fostered compliance. Starting in late 2007, the curriculum was loaded onto CDs and starting at the highest level within the division. Each leader taught their immediate subordinates the lesson plan and so on in a chain teaching method down to the small unit level. This was done some of the he during some of the heaviest fighting in Iraq. Data drove the lesson plan development and delivery. Data was collected from troops both before and after the training to assess the training's impact. For me, the results were simply astonishing. In practically every problem area across the board as revealed by the MHAT surveys, troops showed statistically significant improvement while they were fighting. For example, the number who did not know how to respond to troubling ethical situations dropped by almost 63%. The number who saw comrades mistreat civilians dropped by two thirds. The number who would report their comrades for harming civilians, well, it's not perfect, but it jumped over 50%. The team was self-critical in assessing the reasons for this market improvement. And in the end, after reviewing the data, they believed the most significant factor in achieving these results was the role of leadership, leadership being engaged in the instruction, talking to the troops. I don't disagree with this, but I suggest that there are two other factors that might also have had an impact. First, consistent with the survey of the young majors at CGSC, the method of instruction was in more of a seminar or discussion format. Second, as we will see when I cover some really interesting case studies from around the world in a few minutes, moral and practical intensity matter. For these troops living this every day, this stuff was real on a daily basis. And that may have had a role to play. Okay. That's one example from a particular unit in a particular conflict. What happens when we take a broader look at the different things that impact troops from different countries in terms of them complying with IHL? The ICRC has been collecting data on IHL compliance and the reasons for it for over two decades. The recent work of Fiona Terry, Brian McQuinn, Andrew Bell and others in the ICRC's 2018 study, The Roots of Restraint in War, is an outstanding resource to begin addressing this question. In this study, they surveyed 409 Australian soldiers and 1,030 Filipino soldiers and gathered additional information on studies that had been done involving these soldiers. Their findings were very important to consider in developing any lesson plan for IHL. 
First, they noted the role that stress plays in ethical decision-making by troops under challenging conditions. Second, they found that the level of credibility that soldiers assess of their IHL instructors depends on which military we're talking about, and that lawyers are not necessarily highly regarded as instructors of IHL. And on the other hand, civilian instructors can be highly regarded depending on their experiences, depending on the country, depending on the military culture. Importantly for many of the troops, the threat of punishment under IHL did not appear to be a very big factor in motivating people to refrain from IHL violations. Next, the importance of the type of unit and the informal norms of the unit, for lack of a better word, unit culture. Its mission, all of these things impact compliance with IHL. For junior enlisted soldiers, depending on their military and the type of unit they were in, what their officer commanders thought about IHL compliance did not necessarily matter very much. Instead, for some, what mattered most were the beliefs and the opinions, the actions of the non-commissioned officer leaders who were closest to the soldiers had a much greater impact in this regard. Importantly though, the soldiers did pay attention to general collective military values, common ethical values of military professionalism as expressed within the particular military cultures that they were part of. The researchers concluded that the bonds between comrades and the positive application of military authority, the positive application of military authority could have value as an IHL training vehicle, taking a different approach than is ordinarily done in IHL instruction in many places. I'd like to shift gears now and move from examples of empirical research into the attitudes and behaviors of troops in the large scale settings to a number of smaller case studies that taken together bring out a number of important points I think we should really consider when designing a system of IHL education and training. One thing a number of respondents in the 2001 Leavenworth survey had identified as a training challenge was the need to introduce stress in the training to make it more effective, more memorable, uh, more realistic, to replicate aspects of combat conditions. A group of Norwegian researchers did this in 2010 when they took almost 100 military cadets and assessed their moral reasoning patterns in a rested state and then during a state of sleep deprivation during a combat simulation. Their research showed some interesting results. Even though the ethical dilemmas the cadets reasoned through were not necessarily specifically related to IHL. First, we should note that these cadets all had prior military experience. It's not like conditions of sleep deprivation were a brand new experience for them. Second, those cadets who employed principled high level moral reasoning when they were in a rested state largely lost this capability in a sleep deprived state. Instead, they downshifted to taking a rules-based approach, something perhaps like the 10 basic IHL soldiers rules that US soldiers are taught. However, what largely did not happen was shifting all the way down to the lowest level of moral reasoning, taking a, a self-interested self -interested or transactional approach when the cadets were sleep deprived. Oh, that's, that's very significant. Uh, that's a very important finding because this convinces me that I was wrong what I thought before about viewing things like the 10 soldiers rules as too simplistic to be really useful. Instead, I recognize now that probably they should be seen as the baseline moral reasoning default setting that trained military personnel could be capable of sustaining in combat-like conditions. I see them as the proper foundation to base a system of IHL education and training upon, and they need to be interwoven throughout our programs at all levels. Finally, with regard to this study, um, we know from the MHAT surveys in Iraq and Afghanistan that good leadership is a protective factor in soldiers complying with IHL and maintaining their mental health. 
Some of the researchers from this study conducted a subsequent study with cadets and found that good leadership appears to mitigate the deleterious effects of sleeplessness on moral reasoning and, and upon performance and behavior. So again, we come back to the reinforcing role played by good leadership in IHL compliance by their troops. A Swiss study a year later did not test reasoning in a simulated combat environment, but instead approached the building of moral reasoning skills in officers a couple years older than the Norwegian cadets were, doing it in an academic setting at the Swiss Defense Academy. In this study, 46 students were provided a carefully and highly structured holistic learning environment in which the quality of their moral reasoning skills was assessed at the start of the program, at the end of the week-long program, and then, importantly, six months later. The researchers found a number of things we really must factor into taking a leader-led, values-oriented approach to IHL training. First, the good news. The results of the testing done six months after the program had finished showed that the officers still retained, to a large degree, the skills that they had learned in the program. So these skills, these moral reasoning skills, which we know from the Norwegian study can be quickly degraded by combat conditions, they have a shelf life in peacetime conditions. But this is perhaps at least half a year, perhaps even longer. And that's important because the thing that we would like to accomplish, of course, is a sustainable program, an affordable program of effective instruction. This suggests to me that if we really want to build these approaches into our leaders so that they can model them for the lead, we're going to need fairly regular refreshment instruction. And by that, I mean occurring more frequently than the schoolhouse academic experiences most officers would have during the course of their careers. Next, even though the program was conducted in an academic setting, the researchers found that the officers applied more rigorous moral analysis in dilemmas that presented the greatest risk of injury or damage. This is important. Perhaps we don't need a combat simulation as part of annual IHL training for this skill building to be effective. There's a way to dial up the moral intensity to best exercise these skills, potentially without setting foot in the training area. Lastly, the researchers found that although the officers had well-developed military problem-solving skills, this capability did not extend to moral issues being solved. This suggests to me that we just can't assume a capable officer or soldier will figure these things out at the level that we want them to achieve. Instead, we need specialized education and training approaches to this. And based on what knowledge I have in terms of what's in the public domain and, and my experiences, I'm not certain that what we generally do today necessarily qualifies. Three years after the Swiss study, in a very different setting, I found a direct example of empirical assessment in IHL training that captured my imagination. Cynthia Petri of the NGO Beyond Peace delivered basic IHL and human rights training to several hundred raw Malian soldiers as they were training for a combat deployment to the north of the country. And yes, that is a photo of Cynthia training troops uh, in a different country that's on the cover of the book. Uh, and I'm so grateful she let me use it. I was taken with the picture the first time I saw it because to me, um, it represents all the main points that I'm trying to bring out in the book. Back to Molly. Not only was the training environment austere, but because many of the, the soldiers were not literate, it, it's not that they were bad soldiers, but because they were not literate and they also did not share common languages with their instructor, this was an added level of complexity in terms of delivering effective instruction. There were a number of things that struck me about the training that she conducted. First was the extensive research she did in advance to more fully understand the cultures the soldiers were coming from and what some of the problems had been in the past with soldiers not complying with legal norms and their operations in that area. Second, she took a holistic approach 
and distilled IHL, human rights law, and norms related to preventing sexual violence down to basics that could be effectively conveyed to her training audience in their training situation. Third, she used low-tech field expedient techniques to deliver and to reinforce what she was teaching, including pictorial representations of the norms she was instructing, um, which were also captured in a weather-resistant pocket guide that she had made that the soldiers could take with them and consult. At first I thought, yes, what an effective way to get through the language literacy barrier. But when I further considered all of this in context and looking at it in the context of the research of the, with the Norwegian cadets, I realized this was much more than just breaking the literacy or language barrier. When you're driving a car and you come to a stop sign, you don't need to be able to read the word stop to know that you're supposed to stop the car. The sign has colors, the sign has a shape. These things don't compel you to stop by themselves, but instead they act together to reinforce your restraint in driving your vehicle. Next, she found ways to get the soldiers to see that by wearing the uniform of their country, they were taking on certain responsibilities, a professional ethos. They were soldiers, not bandits. And finally, she found ways to conduct informal empirical assessment to help guide her instruction. For example, asking for a show of hands and answering questions. And, and yes, I understand that there could be concerns with the analytical rigor of such an approach, but these can be managed to a degree. And it's an effective way, teaching in challenging circumstances to be able to gather useful data instead of just relying on assumptions. I'm grateful to Colonel Brian Ketz, U.S. Army, who allowed me to be part of the next case study. Colonel Ketz was the commander of the 16th Special Troops Battalion in Germany. And in 2017, he determined that he was not satisfied with his battalion's leadership development program. So his staff developed a program of connected lessons that were taught over the course of a few months for both the officers and the non-commissioned officers in the unit. His staff chose to use military decision-making in a moral context that occurred during the Holocaust as the overarching theme of the training. And it concluded with a staff ride to the Nazi extermination camp at Auschwitz and to the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, where the trials of the major Nazi war criminals were held. His staff used a mixture of different tech teaching techniques and brought in from the outside uh, military and civilian instructors in, in specific special areas, delivering specific parts of the, the overall lesson plan. Importantly, <clears throat> Colonel Ketz was present in every class that was given, and he used the different classes to emphasize specific leadership points to his officers and NCOs in the discussions that they would have. Although it would have been best to conduct a pre-training survey to more effectively quantify the effect of the training, a post-training survey conducted of the officers and NCOs showed that they believe the leadership development program gave them a better understanding of the relationship between IHL as law and ethical decision-making as leaders. The respondents also noted a very high level of an increased sense of unit cohesion after they did the training together. While they were there on site in, in Auschwitz, they, they spent two full days there receiving tours of the complex. In the evenings, the officers and the NCOs ate together, and the commander and the unit chaplain led them in discussions to consider the impact of what they had experienced during the day and what that meant to them as leaders today. The survey results showed that for the participants, the single most memorable and impactful thing of all the training was the staff ride. And many remarked on the emotional impact that it had upon them in terms of considering their own ethical decision-making process as leaders. So let's think back to the Norwegian study. Conditions of physical stress in combat simulation led to changes in ethical decision-making patterns that could be measured. The Swiss study done in an academic setting showed scenarios with a higher degree of harm and moral intensity led to better reasoned moral decisions that could be measured. This study from this battalion 
shows that non-physically stressful immersion in a, a site of, of great moral tragedy produces positive learning outcomes that can be measured. We must consider the role of stress in developing our lesson plans. And there are many different ways to induce it, but it requires some careful planning to get it right, I suspect. Finally, let's turn to the role of information technology and specifically the use of so-called first-person shooter war video games in IHL instruction. The ICRC has taken a, a leading role in working with the war video game industry to include IHL instruction in some fashion in their games. One result is that the company Bohemia Interactive, who produced the popular Armor 3 war video game, uh, Bohemia Interactive has developed an IHL module that players can use to simulate a combat environment with civilians and those who are out of combat. Before that occurred though, a group of educators at Queens University in Belfast developed their own version to use with ARMA 3 and tested it with their undergraduate and graduate students as a graded exercise in their IHL course. Their experiences and the case study from Japan that I will talk about next are really important to consider in terms of making greater use of information technology and game formats to teach younger tech savvy troops. The researchers at Queens University found that the academic environment, where of course the students were very concerned about their grades and what it meant for their economic futures, appeared to impact the way they played the game because they were unfamiliar with this sort of exercise and, and they did not want to mess it up. Further, the researchers, the educators found a, a limitation in, in the way they had structured it. Um, students who made the wrong choices, unfortunately, were not able to explain why they had made a particular choice. And of course, this kind of explanation and then getting feedback as to why that's not correct is, is vitally important. And quite frankly, feedback doesn't occur enough, I don't think, in terms of the IHL instruction and education that we give our troops today. However, the professors did find that this uh, approach using the, the first person shooter uh, war video game <clears throat> was very well suited to develop an, an, uh, developing an understanding of IHL in small group work. This kind of collaborative work lends itself to seminar or discussion type instruction formats. So this is something else to keep in mind for young troops. And it's consistent with some of the other information we've already looked at. The final case study I would like to talk about concerns the research that Professor Manai at the Osaka University of Economics and Law conducted with his students. Professor Manai was able to use the developed Armor 3 IHL module with his IHL students. And after a number of iterations has confirmed some important findings with at least his students, but they're ones that we need to consider as to whether they're applicable for others as well. First, he was able to identify six distinct learning patterns by the students in terms of how they went through the games. The patterns ranged all the way from students who were very diligent and undertook the instruction on IHL prior to beginning the play. And then there were those who just simply wanted to learn the hard way. And it is by going directly into the module in like a plug and play fashion and just begin shooting stuff. This last group essentially learned by mistake. And when they shot a civilian or someone out of combat, they would receive an admonition from the computer program itself as to what they had done wrong. If we are to make greater use of these games for practical, economic, and military effectiveness reasons, we really need more basic research to understand how students will play their interaction in order to reach the desired learning outcomes. Professor Manai determined that those students who learned the hard way by just shooting basically, they did eventually learn the basic rules after they received the admonitions only as those apply to specific situations, potentially the ones on which they had been admonished. What these students did not achieve was a holistic understanding at a higher level of moral reasoning in their application of IHL principles to other situations that they hadn't experienced. 
this presents potentially an ethical design issue. Are we okay with students and soldiers learning basic IHL principles through recklessly killing virtual civilians and those out of combat? I don't know the answer to that, but for me, the bottom line is that even if we were satisfied that they understood that a game is just a game and it's not real life, we are perhaps only going to achieve a rules-based level of reasoning. Now, this is okay if a, a clear and interwoven rules-based approach is used throughout our instruction, but if that's the highest level that we're going to reach, I'm not certain we would find that adequate. Finally, what does this mean for teaching machines IHL? And by this, of course, I mean artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous weapons. Can we comfortably do so unless we have a better idea of how we would effectively model the human moral decision-making process and the decision-making processes used by commanders and operators who would find themselves in charge and being responsible for these weapons and what occurred through their use? Let me thank you again for joining us this afternoon to talk about a, an approach, taking a different approach to IHL education and training. Of course, the dissemination and integration of IHL and military activities and operations is fundamental to achieving compliance with IHL in the field, right? This has to occur first, but it's simply not enough. Many of the tools we have right now could be usefully adapted in taking an approach that is both data-driven and human-oriented. Taking this sort of approach would also have additional benefits. For example, um, in terms of, of uh, our modern appreciation of the world, from the beginning, fitting in modern and proper understandings of the gender differentiated and more severe impact of armed conflict upon women and girls, but not from the traditional perspective of viewing females as victims or being accorded rights only on the basis of their reproductive or marital status, but instead looking at them as people at greater risk in the area of operations, suffering wars impacts because of potential marginalization in their societies, which has an impact on achieving security and stability at the end, as shown by data. This approach would be a bit of an undertaking, I admit that, but let's start small. Let's start by simply counting different things in our work than the ones we count now. I look forward to your questions. Uh, and if you're shy, no worries, here's my email address. If we run out of time and you have additional questions or wanna share something from your work or experience, I'm all ears, uh, contact me, I, I would love to hear from you. And then finally, the publisher of the book, uh, Anthem Press, good people, have generously created a discount code that you could use if you wanted to get a 20% discount on the book. So thank you all again. I'm, I'm so grateful for you all uh, joining in this afternoon uh, with me to talk about this. And Christian, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jody. It was an excellent talk for someone who works in IHL dissemination. And a lot of the stuff you talked about is things that I think about every day, the impact of dissemination programs within the, the, the public to civilians. Um, I think it's just as beneficial as something you mentioned with regards to interpreting world events, um, it, it creating greater expectations of what we expect of ourselves and those in positions of power, both political and military. Uh, so thank you for the work that you did to provide empirical data that we can see the impact of what is doing well and where things can improve. So thank you for that. Um, we did have some questions, so no, not a really shy group here. Um, the, the first question addressed is, do you think there is a correlation rule space understanding that the people learning by admonition in the game sleep desperation do you think there's a correlation between the, the rules based understanding yeah that's why um with the you know as i was doing <clears throat> further research as i got deeper into this I, I realized in particular you know these case studies from across the world that were you know fairly small in scope all had brought out points that crosswalked with other studies when you were looking at it from the perspective of effectiveness in terms of what you were trying to achieve. So I, I, it appears that there is a correlation. Um, I would like to see this research much more in depth 
it would be very good to know more about it. You know, we can't obviously we can't rely on on just one study, but it's an intriguing idea. It's an intriguing possibility that I think really should be looked into further. Excellent. And then our next question is in Ma in the Mali case study that you provided. How did the instructor uh, involve the chain of command in teaching the soldiers? Was it a train the trainer approach or did she speak directly to the soldiers with the leaders present? Was there ever a follow up with the Malayan army about the lessons? Uh, so based on my interviews with her, and she was very generous with her time, um, she did much more than, than just instruct. And I only captured basically the surface level of the innovative techniques that she came up with. You know, for example, uh, uh, she also uses sand tables to great effect to talk about IHL. Mm, not something that's ordinarily done in a lot of places. But if you're dealing with uh, an illiterate audience, and you're faced with a short amount of training time in, a, in a, an austere training environment, it can be very useful. <clears throat> the other thing that she did, Christian, was that she wasn't just there for the instruction. She stayed and was part of the, uh, the training exercises that they would have at the end as they were actually preparing for deployment. And so she made sure that she was interacting with the officers who were conducting that training and that they understood the kinds of things that she had covered in her classes to the soldiers. And importantly, she was there at that training that the soldiers were going through. Uh, that sounds sends a very powerful message. And, and that's one of the reasons why I, I love the, the picture that she let me use. IHL is everybody's business. It's not just for the military, <clears throat> civilians, uh, it, it's just as important as well. Men, women, it's not just Western or developed countries. It's something everybody should be looking at and figuring out ways to, to do a better job of counting. Because when you start counting, you have the basis for accountability. OK, excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question we have, and you can go into as much detail as you want, because I think it's asking more for your opinion than your research, unless you found any. But okay. what types of leadership factors had an impact? Can you go into some detail on what good or high quality uh, NCO leadership looks like? Uh, no, I cannot. Uh, do I have an impression from my own experiences from 25 years in the Army? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> but from the studies themselves, I don't. Um, it would be very useful to uh, get further into the data from those reports. For example, to see what kinds of, of additional information came out during the focus groups that were conducted. So, you know, importantly, the, the mental health advisory teams did not just rely on the administration of the surveys. They took a holistic approach. They crosswalked those results with focus groups that, that brought out a, a lot more granularity, a lot more detail. Perhaps if, if one could get into those um, findings from those groups, uh, it could have a, a better idea. Regrettably, I, I could not say definitively what those were specifically identified there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, one more que uh, question is about what happens with IHL training when someone, you know, experiences great trauma from the horrors of the, like being on the front lines of the battlefield. Did you see, it's a, as the comment says in the Q and A, it says a great emotional challenge for people that are on the front line. Um, you know, how does this affect IHL training moving forward when someone has experienced something like that? Is it possible that they're more, you know, just turned away by some of the things that are required of them, I guess, or I, did you see anything in your research on how trauma affects IHL training? Um, specifically in, in that regard, no. <clears throat> but one thing I would like to bring up from the ethical, the battlefield ethics training program that was done is that to me and, and uh, the, the authors of the study, um, I would be glad to, to have my notions disabused if this were the case. But it struck me when I was looking at the results that the tremendously positive improvements that they had noted across the board in terms of how the soldiers dealt with the combat situation they were in and how they were handling it from a, a mental health perspective, right? In terms of, of compliance or, or I should say refraining from not complying. It seems to me that this would have a salutary effect in terms of the amount of the trauma that the soldiers might experience over the course of a deployment. So one of the things I'm suggesting in, in that regard is that an effective IHL training program that is human oriented and driven by data might have the impact of lessening the trauma, 
a moral injury that the soldiers might experience uh, as they go through combat. It would be something worth looking into. All right. And then uh, I have a two part question. So let's just start with the first one is um, this person wants to know more about what made you consider the moral cost that faces members when they are faced with these situations. All right, I, I guess. Say that again. It, the question is, uh, the person wants to know more about what made you consider the moral cost in your research, I take it, that faces members when um, when they are faced with, I, I guess, traumatic situations or possible sure, sure. scenario situations. Yeah, thank you. That That's an excellent question because it gets to the heart of why, you know, the, the, the 5,000 word blog post turned into the book. And there was no one single thing that prompted me to, to write the book. I recognize now that I'm done. I look back and I see how a lot of different things came together in terms of my experiences and my research. But there is one thing that stands out. <clears throat> and that was the, the work that I did as a member of the team uh, from West Point and from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in putting together the Ordinary Soldiers Lesson Plan, which uses moral decision-making by reserve Wehrmacht officers and occupied Belarus uh, in killing Jewish civilians as a way to engage in small group discussions in a discussion and seminar format with all sorts of different audiences. Uh, American military, uh, we've used it with international officers, we've used it with civilians, we use it with cadets at different universities. It's there that I finally began realizing that the approach that for so long I had hewed to was that <clears throat> the problem with IHL non-compliance is that people just aren't following the law. If they would just follow the law, we wouldn't have a problem. I've learned. Uh, I realized I was wrong. I, I was perhaps blinded by my professional perspective. The morality of it has an impact to play. Personal moral values, religious values, professional values, for example, like in this um, case study I mentioned, the ordinary soldiers, two of the German officers were school teachers. This is a reserve unit. Um, so they had this additional professional ethos overlaying their decision making, you would think, of caring for kids. And yet one company commander decided to kill babies. So that has to have a significant moral component. And it is one that I had, quite frankly, not paid enough attention to when I was on active duty. And I think the moral cost, because everything does have a cost, the moral cost of decision making as well is something that we really need to, to talk more about and talk more about particularly with younger soldiers and officers, I think. Excellent point. I um, mean, the second part of the question, I'm gonna have the individual who asked it uh, at, just ask directly. Uh, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> Justina, uh, if, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, feel free to ask your second part of your question. Justina, thank you for joining. Yeah, hi, Jody. How are you? Nice to see you. Likewise. Um, I, you unmuted me. I don't know how to do anything else about the video, so I'll just leave it like that for now. That's fine. Um, and yeah, I asked the first part of the question. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. We have discussed these moral issues one-on-one uh, -on -one a lot. The second question, though, I had was, did you consider or are you considering looking into some of the, I guess, specific factors that stress um, uh, members in combat? And, and by that, I meant um, Christian members, like military members in particular, for example, Islamophobia um, or kind of a, a, I guess an ignorance or a pre prejudice of maybe the environment soldiers are in that then kind of exacerbates the situation and causes them to do something more. Uh, yeah. I just wondered what you thought yeah. about that. So the, the answer is, and, and particularly with the experiences that you had, absolutely yes. But what I would suggest, Justina, is that at the same time, we should look into the positive things that are going to be impacting the way that soldiers think and deal with how they make decisions out in the field. And so you, you may remember in, in uh, the introduction, the first slide I had mm -hmm. talking about creating a multidisciplinary team. And I said, well, maybe even throw in a couple of war correspondents. Um, I think I found a, an example of an ethical decision-making driver of a performance driver uh, among US troops not from reading any official publications, but instead from reading uh, Sebastian Younger's War. And mm -hmm. in there, 
uh, he talks about his experiences when he was in Afghanistan and he made a mistake one day. He went to a shurer and he had been wearing an old army shirt of some sort and he left it at the shurer. Mm -hmm. And and of course, that's a big problem because potentially someone could have given it to a Taliban member and they could have infiltrated and, and hurt uh, the soldiers there at the outpost. And the soldiers were incredibly, incredibly disappointed wow. in him for his thoughtlessness, his mindlessness in endangering their security. And this, uh, and forgive me, I must, I must pronounce this because otherwise we're not going to capture the full flavor of it. He called, Sebastian Yoger calls this the Zen of not fucking up, right? Yeah. This is a tremendous driver in terms of why troops would do positive things. So if we can get to the point where we've got soldiers who are taking on basic IHL concepts and principles in a complementary fashion with the positive parts of military culture, perhaps the salty Zen of, of, of Mr. Youngers, um, then we have a way of, of potentially mitigating at the very least, maybe counteracting the very important points that you brought up, because those are going to be there. We, we can't ignore those. We, how can they not have an impact? Um, so I appreciate your question, Justina. Yeah, that's right on point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and wonderful, wonderful research. Well, thank you. And then, you know, we're getting a lot more questions, but uh, the next one is from Jill Hoffman. I'm going to take her off mute really quick so uh, she can just ask it directly. If that's okay with you. Hi, Jill. Thank you, Jody. This has been amazing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, good. Um, I just want to share with you, I wear two hats. I'm international humanitarian law instructor. I worked as a delegate in the Bosnian War and I have a disaster mental health hat too. Excellent. So what I am concerned with, and I've heard it from military that I listened to about their experience, and I also saw heard, heard about it through other um, resources, is that quite often uh, the frontline uh, military personnel are put in front of the... Um, in, in front of the, their enemy who's then shot their best friend or their buddy and they see him killed in front of him and they almost have a knee-jerk reaction so I have two responses to that your 10 um, your list of 10 things is that embedded in people and then the other thing I wanted to focus on is it's really important to have cultural context and I love what Cynthia did because if you're aware of the cultural context, then you're aware of the religion, the morality, the family and the community that the oh, yeah. soldier comes from. Oh, yeah. And it makes such a huge difference. And in terms of mental health, I saw Medicine Sans Frontier when I was working in the war. Medicine Sans Frontier were the only people who supported the snipers afterwards by counseling them. And um, what I found is from listening to their stories, was, was that the horrible, horrible effects of coming home and feeling shamed. And um, I think that the ICRC, um, in some ways we can learn from them because what they do is they look at the cultural context. They, they train the Taliban as well as the government officials in IHL. They work with the FARC in Colombia, with a rebel group as much as they work with the Colombian government and they sort of instill that. And I think the cultural context is key in what you mentioned. And the other thing is, how do you embed those 10 principles to the military when they have these incredibly visceral responses, when they see the ve their very friends being killed in front of them? Oh, thank you for that. And, and Jill, I admit it, <clears throat> it's, it would be a tough nut to crack. I think it can be done. At, at least in part, because what I, I worry about is that at the present time, there is insufficient crosswalking between telling soldiers what they should do, right, the 10 basic rules, and then marrying that up with the experiences that they have, applying those rules, and importantly, how it makes them feel. That isn't necessarily a level to which a lot of people might want to go. Um, you start finding out some uncomfortable things about yourself, your buddies, your unit, your impressions and your attitudes. And yet, can it be dealt with effectively? 
unless we establish this kind of crosswalk. Um, let's be frank, and I'm speaking as, as you know, a typical military guy, I'm not the most introspective person, right? I don't necessarily have an easy time talking about my experiences and how they make me feel, particularly in challenging circumstances. Now, yeah, all right, that's a reflection of a masculinity I grew up with and, and you know, sought to emulate, I suppose. But unless we can get to that level that you talked about of approaching this in a holistic way and begin making these connections between IHL education and training, the positive impact of leadership and the acknowledgement of, of the cost of doing your job and, and then a way for absolution or forgiveness uh, in terms of going forward, if you were just doing your job and doing it properly, these are so important. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Excellent. And then, uh, Joe, if you're able to stay on just a few more minutes, we have a few questions that- I've on. I, I am yours. All right, perfect. Uh, the next couple are kind of based on, I guess, you know, more on like a, reset, a research uh, approach, I guess. So is there any practical pointers on how to gather data to measure the effect effectiveness of IHL training in soldiers? And then also, uh, did you find anything in your research that showed any maybe impact gender of the instructor had at all? I wasn't sure if, if you know, I don't think you mentioned in your, your data set if that's something that was considered or not. In terms of, of gender from other than the example <clears throat> with the work that, that Cynthia did, uh, mm -hmm. not just in Mali, of course, but in, you know, for example, on the cover of the book, Central African Republic, I have to admit, uh, even though professionally, I'm very interested in gender and military operations, I didn't find a lot. I, I came across very right. little specifically gender oriented. Okay. And it's probably something that's more connected to culture uh, as well, depending on maybe it's, it's uh, environmental, it depends, situational, I should say on where the training is taking place, perhaps, I don't know. Yeah, that, that could have an, an impact, but I think as Cynthia showed as well, um, gaining credibility with the soldiers, the, with the training audience is so important. And you know the steps that she took being with them all the way through their training, living there at the training area, you know, instead of some hotel in town, um, making the best of what she had to work with yeah. them. Um, it struck me that the very thorough preparation and the thoroughness with which the instruction was delivered, showed the soldiers she cared about what they were thinking and that this was important to her. <clears throat> and I have the impression that that gave her a lot of positive credibility, whereas in other situations, the culture clash between, say, for example, um, an African military unit and a, a European civilian might otherwise have seemed quite large. Um, but it appears she was very effective in working around that. Right. And then any practical pointers on how to gather data or any like maybe follow-up surveys? Do you think hypothetical type situations, asking questions that are hypothetical and seeing responses to those? Or how, how, what's your recommendations for data of effectiveness? Yeah, I think this is something that needs to be researched a lot more, Christian, because, yeah. you know, we look at the Battlefield Ethics Training Program and for me, part of the success of that in terms of demonstrating the, the quantitative improvement across the board was the fact that these MHAT surveys had been done with these very unusual questions. I, I have not been able to find any other large surveys that were asking these kinds of questions of soldiers in the middle of combat. And that meant that the Battlefield Ethics Training Program had problem areas identified to which it could calibrate its training. That's tremendously important because if we don't know what we're trying to fix, we're going to be making guesses. And quite frankly, that's what we've been doing for the last hundred years or so, right? We need to move away from making assumptions and start getting back to way left of boom, right? We need to start thinking about, for example, the political courage of the American military commanders who allowed these questions to be asked. Because once these questions are asked, they can't be, if I you know, may paraphrase Omar Khayyam, you can't unask them. That data then becomes real and enduring. And the ability to ask these questions, then they were only asked those two years, as best I can tell, showed me that there needs to be greater buy-in from an institutional perspective in undertaking this kind of project. And that it's gonna be long-term and it's got to set the conditions 
for the effective information gathering. And you really can't craft a, a program uh, that's going to work well unless you are actually dealing with problems. You are just going to be guessing. So I guess what I would say is I don't have any more tips you know, that I was able to find. I have some ideas, some suggestions. But, but my response would be, don't worry about the questions. Worry about the environment that will allow other questions to be asked to develop the database that you can use to calibrate the kinds of questions that you want to be using in your training program to determine whether, in fact, you're having any impact at all. Right. Um, and then the next question is, uh, in teaching IHL the troops, um, is how do you, I guess the first question I'll ask is, how do you address with troops, or did you see this in your research, you know, any cultural prohibition about being a, a quote, tattletale if they see a violation of fellow soldiers? I guess during your research or maybe trainings that you've experienced personally, how, how is it addressed when, you know, talking about uh, accountability of like a, a colleague on, you know, a violation, I guess, is what the question's asking. Right. And so this troubled me as, as I was doing my research. And uh, after reading Sebastian Yoger's book and looking at his salty Zen, I realized that we just need to not go there. Instead, we need to keep this from happening. We need to keep the need to snitch on one's comrades from occurring. If we're able to leverage the Zen of, of Younger's to get soldiers to be mindful that their performance on the field of battle, including compliance with IHL, will reflect positively in terms of the safety of them and their buddies getting home at the deployment, then somebody deciding to go astray is no longer a question of, well, I wouldn't do that, but I'm not going to turn in my buddy. It becomes a question of, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, we want to get out of this one alive. We'd like to win this one. What are you doing? If the judgment of the group is against the individual who is beginning to go astray, that could have a very positive effect in terms of getting people, although their thinking may not be quite where we want it, from acting on those impulses. Because I think it's going to be very, very hard to get people. It's going to be a tough nut to crack. You know, there's another aspect of it as well. Suppose you do what you're supposed to do, and you do report. I think as we've seen with a number of American courts martial here in the last few years, right? You do what you're supposed to do, but then you're not necessarily backed up by, oh, the political system, right? Yeah. And maybe you're not even backed up by the chain of command because I don't know, we, we work to be very careful to make sure that we don't impinge on soldiers due process rights, you know, when they're accused of crimes. But are there steps that could be taken to provide feedback to the, the soldiers who reported it, to the units that they operate side by side with, who are now wondering, can we trust these guys, right? Making it a positive thing that if there was a question, it endangers about what happened in terms of not following the law of armed conflict, this is serious. This endangers our entire mission, and we need to look into it. Um, I don't think we're there. I think that's what I, I meant in the beginning about not just talking the talk, but actually doing it, finding ways to support this important part. What we look to see is a crucial piece of IHL compliance, but maybe we just we don't make it easier to snitch, although that would be helpful, right? But maybe yeah. we find a way to avoid the need to report your buddies. We don't even get there, right? That's right. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's amazing insight. It's kind of reframing. I mean, it's kind of reframing how it's looked at. Not necessarily you're making it a more community-based uh, thing rather than you know a violation of trust within the community. It's the responsibility to report is kind of out of respect and you know, of your, you know, entrustment with your fellow comrades, et cetera, um, rather than one to be punitive damage the relationships within it. Um, the, and I think the final question will, you know, we'll stop here since we're about 10 minutes over, but it's uh, what is your hope for adoption of your concepts in the U.S. military or elsewhere? What do you hope to achieve uh, with, with this new book? Right. And what would you like to see change? 
Yeah. So I, I think realistically, um, I'm nobody. Um, I, I, today for me is, is an incredibly positive development because we're all talking about these things together, <clears throat> but I, I don't have any power. I don't have a position of, you know, prestige at a particular university or anything like that. There's very little that, that I can do. Um, I would want to see, I'm hopeful that the, the book and opportunities to talk to, to folks who are interested in this would, would provide an opportunity for more people to ask the kinds of questions that we've been talking about here, uh, which I think are so important. And, and it's gonna happen lots of different places and it's gonna happen probably from the roots up. <clears throat> I'm under no illusions. Uh, it's not like after this presentation, uh, the Judge Advocate General of the Army is going to call me up and say, Jody, that, that was an interesting presentation. I'd like you to come down to, to Charlottesville and talk to my training development folks, right? That's not going to happen. Uh, and, 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 and I would be very naive if I was, uh, you know, expecting that to occur as a result. So we must be realistic. But importantly, we have to start talking about these things in a fashion that makes sense to those who control the resources and who make the decisions in terms of how the different pieces of the resources are going to work together. So I'm, I'm hopeful that it's at least the start. Um, I realize that, um, you know, I've got small hands. I'm a small guy. Uh, there's very little I can do other than bring up the issues and, and, you know, enjoy the opportunity uh, to talk about the kinds of things we've been talking about here today to raise awareness. Well, if your goal is to, you know, stimulate conversation, you've certainly done that today. I know I'm excited to jump into the book, as I've mentioned to you multiple times. Um, and then I want to thank everyone for coming in and, and Jody, I can't thank you en uh, enough. Um, you know, you've started a conversation here and everyone here knows someone else that can continue that conversation. So I think we're going in the great. exact direction that you hope we are. So thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. Again, uh, the recording will be at www.rulesofwar.org slash webinars. And if you're interested in learning more about the American Red Cross IHL dissemination program, please contact your local American Red Cross office for more information. Uh, you know, Jody, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye. Very much appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you.